In this tutorial, we're going to show you how to take a full 3D model, import it into the software, and unwrap it to create toolpaths to cut on a rotary axis. So let's just go to File, Close. As with any wrapped rotary job, we need to come over to the Gadgets section, under Wrapping, where we specify the wrapped job setup, and that's going to open up the wrapped job setup form. So here we're going to specify uh, various parameters for our job. So cylinder dimensions, this is the dimensions of the cylinder that we're going to cut into. So the length I'm going to put in a value of 12, the diameter is 4, and we're working with inches here. Then we move on to the cylinder orientation along the x-axis or the y-axis. And this is where we choose to wrap the y-values around the rotary axis, or we could choose to wrap the x-values around the rotary axis. And this is dependent on the orientation of your CNC's rotary axis. So you will need to check with the manufacturer or look at your CNC in order to see which setup you have. For demonstration purposes, we're going to keep the linear axis along X, where we're going to look at wrapping the Y values. Then we move on to the XY drawing origin. In this case, we're going to go in the lower left. Then we need to specify our Z0 origin, where we have cylinder surface, or the top, or cylinder axis, which is the bottom. I'm going to use the cylinder axis option, as this is going to be the most reliable choice, as it's much harder to set your Z0 off the outside edge of your cylinder, because that requires your cylinder to be a perfect circle in order for this to be correct. Now, the cylinder axis is the equivalent in the software to setting your Z0 to the bottom of the block on a regular three-axis job. Then we move on to the wrapping layout. We have simple cylindrical wrap or a spiral wrap. In this case, I'm going to go with a simple wrap where we cut a straight line along the cylinder and unwrap it. So once we're happy with the settings there, we could go ahead and press OK and the software will automatically create a job for us based on the dimensions we entered in the gadget form. So you can see it's 12 inches long in the x-axis which we specified and the height is defined as if it was the circumference of our cylinder and it's taken that 4 inch diameter and unwrapped it and everything that we do in the software is going to be calculated in a flat environment. And the only time that this output will change to rotary is when we use the post processor that has the ability to do that. Now, we do have the ability to visualize our parts in a rotary environment, and we'll show you how to do that later. And we can see there that the depth has been defined by half of the diameter. So to bring a model into the software, let's go and switch over to the Modeling tab. I'm going to use this icon here to import a component or a 3D model. Now in my project folder, I have a file here uh, which actually is a 3DM file that was created in Rhino software. And this is one of their demonstration files, so we're not able to supply this data for you. But if you watch this video, you should be able to apply the same principles to your own files. So I'm going to open that up. Now, as this is a non-native file, the software will automatically open the Orientate 3D model form, which allows us to set the model up before it's brought into our job and converted into a standard component. So here we need to orient and size the part so that we can unwrap the part correctly. So we need to make sure that the size is appropriate to the size of our part. And we can see that the model is significantly larger than that of our work area. And we can see this indicated by the red square here in the 3D view, which represents our job dimensions. Now this may be down to the fact that the units the model was created in may have been in millimetres, in which case one millimetre is being represented by one inch. So if we use the scale millimetres and inches button, 
that will just decrease that for us and if we take a look in the model size we can see that we have an x value of 12.8911 and this is larger than the 12 inch cylinder that we specified for our x axis so let's look at resizing this and to make sure that we lock xyz ratio so that when I scale one of these values all two other values will be scaled in proportion. So let's go and put in a value of 11 inches in there and then we could just simply press apply. Now we need to know which way our part is facing. So if we go to view and use the option here to draw the origin we can see we're presented with arrows that represent each axis where red represents the x-axis, green represents the y-axis and blue represents the z-axis. Now when setting up the part we need to imagine a cylindrical block running down the linear axis of our machine which in this case is the x-axis. And So we need to ensure that our 3D model here is going to run in the centre of that imaginary cylinder which in this case is going to require us to tilt this down a little bit. Now if we had our setup where the linear axis was along uh, the Y or the green arrow then I'd first need to look at rotating this around 90 degrees where I could do that in the initial orientation stage of the form and make sure that I get the direction correct before I worry about tilting the part. In this case we have the direction correct and it is linear along the X axis. Uh, but what I do need to do is look at tilting the part. So if we look at our part up the Y axis, and so to tilt this we could lock our interactive rotation to the Y axis. So we're going to use the Y option there and then I'm just going to use my mouse click and you can see that I'm able to move or tilt my model down. So I'm just going to roughly position that and so this line that we're looking at uh, we have to imagine that this line represents the centre of our cylinder. I'm just going to come over here and we're just going to alter the zero plane so it's in the middle. So if I just double click there you can see that's now in the middle and again I could just look at positioning that also. So here I can see that the linear axis is clearly passing through the centre of our part. So let's just put the interactive rotation in XYZ so I don't move the model anymore. I like where we've positioned that. We can see it's running through the centre, passing through the centre of our part. So now that we've done that we can simply just go ahead and press OK. And because we're importing this model into a wrapped job setup, the software would know to unwrap this model for us, where we'd press yes. If we selected no, then the software would just import it as a regular 3D model. So we're going to use the yes option here to unwrap our model. And then if we just put that in the ISO view, and so you'll notice we have a rather unusual shape now that we've unwrapped the Y values into the standard 3-axis format. You can see that a component has been created using the same name as the model that we imported. And so we are working in a 3-axis environment here and that's very important to understand that we are always working with a 3-axis part and the only time it's going to become rotary is when we post-process this with a compatible post-processor. And so this is when the Y values will be rotational values. And so that's why we have to unwrap the model so we can see it in this 3-axis environment and work with it using our standard 3-axis toolpaths before we do that output. And the software will enable us to display the part as if it were wrapped around a cylinder. And so to view the model wrapped back up into a rotary model, we need to wrap the 3D view. So if we go to toolpaths, and if we use toolpath drawing, we're going to use this option here to wrap the Y values around the X axis. That's the way we've got our part set up. And so if I click on that, you can see that we're now able to view this as if it was actually on our rotary there.
Now when we set up the job to unwrap it, I spoke about the idea of having this imaginary cylinder that goes through the centre of our job. And so here we can see why this is so important. And there's two reasons for this. One is that we're going to have to have a cylinder of material passing through the job, which will actually be our work holding, which will go into the ends of our chuck to hold it in place whilst it's being machined. And two, as we've brought this model into a three axis environment where we've unwrapped it, we may have lost some detail on the 3D model. For example, at the other end of this handle there was an undercut and so the software has filled that area in with material. And this would be very apparent if you had something like a figurine where you had a space between the arm and the body and that material would get filled in. Also, if you had a highly curved cabriole leg where the cylinder may be passed out of the job and back in again, and that would certainly create some very odd effects with the 3D model. And so the software is only really going to work well if the cylinder passes completely through the centre of the job. Anywhere that it doesn't, we're going to see filled in areas like we've got here. Now we need to think about when we come to toolpath this model and cut it out on the machine, what is going to be keeping this model where it is when we've completely cut it out. If we didn't add anything to the model which would act like a tab to hold it in place during the machining process, it would break free and that would be the end of that machining session. So we'll create a one inch cylinder that will run through the center of our model. So it's small enough so it doesn't interfere with the actual model shape itself, but thick enough to maintain the part being cut where it is during machining. So to add the cylinder through the center of our model, I need to create a flat component and raise it up to merge through our unwrapped component. So let's just go to the toolpaths option, toolpath drawing, we're just going to switch wrapping off and we'll put that in the ISO view. And so to create this flat component, I could just use this option here to add in a zero plane. And this zero plane is just a plane of material that has zero height. So let's just take that, go into the properties and set the combine mode of that to merge so it blends in with our handle model. And then I'm going to apply some height in here just to raise that up a little. So we're only going to create it to the radius of the height that you want the diameter to be. For example, I want this to have a one inch thick diameter, so we're going to go and put that at half an inch high, and then I could just press space bar to enter that in. You can see it's blending in there, we've got half inch height, and then if I just close that down, and if we go back into toolpaths, toolpath drawing, wrap the Y values, you can see here that we have this one inch thick cylinder to provide us with some material to cut down to when we create the toolpaths and it won't end up cutting the part out of our piece of stock. So now that our part is prepped, we can then go and start to think about calculating our toolpaths. So let's just go and switch over to the toolpaths tab. Now in order for us to go and create any toolpaths, we need to switch off the wrapped view as the software needs this to be in a flat environment in order for us to calculate our toolpaths. And as I mentioned, it's the post processor that will actually change the Y values to be the rotational axis. So let's go and check over our material setup. So the thickness here will be half of the depth we specified originally, which was 4 inches, so that's correct. XY date and position is currently set to the lower left hand corner. Now you may wish this to be at the left centre of the block, which means you may need to add in an offset. So we could apply an offset by checking the use offset option. And then for Y, we're just going to simply type in Y for the Y value divided by 2, so that gets us to the center. And then if we press equals, it's going to put that in there. And I must make sure that that's a negative number. So we'll put negative in there and you'll see it's updated the XY date and position. So it's in the center 
of the left hand side here. Now this isn't essential as it's all down to how you want to set the part up. Model position and material, we're going to make sure the model's pushed all the way down to the bottom here. Check over the rapid Z gaps above the material. Quarter inch for both clearance and plunge seems safe enough. Then we move on to the home start position and for the Z gap above the material we'll keep that 2.5 so it's enough to clear the actual thickness plus uh, any of the rapids here. So once we're happy with that we could go ahead and press OK. So the first toolpath we're going to create is a 3D roughing toolpath. First thing I need to do is select a tool from the tool database. Now in this case I'd like to use the same tool for both the roughing and the finishing to avoid any tool changes. Now we don't have a particularly detailed model so I could get away with using quite a large ball nose for both the roughing and the finishing. So I'm going to use the quarter inch ball nose here and I could go ahead and press OK. If we use the edit option here, I could just glance over the settings. Now because this is a roughing pass, I can look at increasing the pass depth to a quarter of an inch and I can also up the step over to 40% and I could just simply go ahead and press OK there. Machine and limit boundary, we're going to use the material boundary in this case. We're not going to apply an offset here. We'll put in a very small machine allowance of 0 0.03, so this is an imaginary thickness of extra skin that will be left on the finished material so we avoid chipping at the finished part on this pass. Uh, Z level, we're going to ra raster this in a Z level strategy along the X axis and then we could just simply go ahead and calculate that and you can see it's put that in our toolpath preview and then I could simply go ahead and preview that toolpath so we're previewing this in a three axis environment in which case once it's done that I can then preview how this looks in the wrapped environment so let's go over to toolpaths toolpath drawing wrap the Y values and we can see how our part or how our 3D roughing pass would look on our rotary Okay, so there's not too much detail to see here, so let's just go out of the wrapped setup, so we'll put wrapping off, we're going to close out of the preview toolpaths form, and now we can look at creating our finishing toolpath. So into the 3D finish toolpath, and so as I mentioned we're going to use this same tool to avoid a tool change. If we use the edit option here we can check over the settings, look at the step over, we can see it's safe and appropriate for a finished toolpath and then we could go ahead and press OK. Machine limit boundary, we're going to use the material boundary. Area machine strategy, we're going to apply a raster strategy in this case. The raster angle is currently at zero degrees, so that will cut along the X axis before stepping over. And this direction is very important when doing a rotary setup. So the tool will cut along the X axis and then there'll be a short rotary move, which is the equivalent of a step over, and then it will raster back again. If we chose to put in 90 degrees so that the toolpath was going in this direction, that would be the equivalent of the part spinning all the way around with the tool then stepping over in X and then spinning all the way around again. And so this all depends on your part and your setup. In this case, we're going to go with zero degrees, give that a name, and then we could just simply press calculate. Okay, so that's calculated that there for us. So again, we could go and preview that toolpath to see how that looks. I could just undraw the draw tool option just to make that go a little bit faster. And so we can see how our part looks in our three axis environment. And once it's calculated that, we can then go over to the toolpaths where we could look at our part in the wrapped view. Okay, so let's go to toolpaths, toolpath drawing, wrap the Y values. And so this is what we'd get if we were to output these toolpaths on our rotary axis. 
So we could go and save those toolpaths if we we're happy with what we can see in our preview here. So to do that, let's just close out there and then we could use the save toolpath option where we'd then select one of the toolpaths to save out and would choose the appropriate post processor for your machine. Now it's very important to note that it has to be a post processor that supports rotary moves. This is the stage where the software is going to take what are essentially three axis calculated toolpaths and then convert them into the rotary. Now the post processor has to support rotary and needs to be set up so that it's configured correctly for what your rotary axis is. For example, uh, if I look at my post processor list I can see that I have Mac 2 3 control program where we have special posts that wrap Y to A and that wrap X to A. Now in our case we are wrapping the Y axis so I need to select the wrap Y to A option and A being the typical designated G code for a rotary move. So I'd select, select this one, wrap Y to A and then I could simply go ahead and save the toolpath and we get a wrapped output reminder just to check over the settings to ensure that they are correct before we go and save them. And then I could simply go ahead press OK and then we can save the file to run on the rotary on the CNC. Now I'm not going to in this case so as I don't intend to actually cut this part so I'm just going to cancel here. And so that concludes this tutorial. Now I'm not able to save this file as I'm unable to share this data as I mentioned at the start of this tutorial. However, the process that you've seen here should work with any model that you wish to unwrap. And it's worth pointing out that you don't have to solely use 3D toolpaths. You can combine those with appropriate 2D or 2.5D toolpaths if you needed to. So that completes this tutorial. Thank you for watching.